We have seen occasions when interest rates were at this level or much higher. However, we've never had this kind of debt to service. And from what I read, the trajectory that we are on right now in terms of just servicing the interest on the debt at that level is almost equal to the Defense Department's expenditure on an annual basis. That's never been the case. And so for that reason, I believe this is a different scenario than what we have seen in the past. Gary Wagner is back. He is the editor of thegoldforecast.com. Welcome back. Always good to see you, Gary. Great to see you, David. I love your new studio, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, good to see you're always doing well. Uh, let's talk about the gold market. The gold market has certainly been doing well over the last four and a half weeks. Uh, certain people have given, well, different people have given me different viewpoints as to why uh, the sudden move. What's your view on why gold all of a sudden rallied V-shaped recovery since the last time we spoke, which was uh, the end of September? Uh, absolutely. Of course, at the end of September, that's when we hit the lows at around 1840. And the numbers I'm giving is basis February gold that became most active a couple of days ago. And then we went into what I'm calling the October rally, which is when there was conflict in the Middle East, taking gold from about 1840 up to $2,019 before retracing slightly. Now it's back up today over $2,000, even though it is down about $8, it's still sitting at roughly uh, $2,012. So I'm extremely bullish. We could get any kind of a pullback in terms of profit taking, but overall, I believe that 2000 will become the new level of support. I want to see that remain that way because so many times we've seen it break above that only to break back below. But I think that that could be a good area of support. And if, in fact, we do see it move higher, I expect it to challenge about 2040. The first it's just time. fascinating, um, even from a technical perspective, how how strong that resistance is. The mythical $2,000 an ounce level. That's the third time I'm looking. No. Yeah. If I look at the chart, that's like four or five times this year. It's tested 2000, briefly breached above 2000 uh, early in the year uh, in May, as you know. Didn't stay there for very long. It just gold does not want to maintain above $2,000. Why? Well, I think it's uh, the shorter term traders pulling profit, to be honest. On the occasions previous to this occasion, there weren't so many multiple factors in play. Right now, we have geopolitical unrest in Ukraine and in the Middle East. On top of that, we have the Federal Reserve's expectation that they might in fact have concluded with rate hikes. We'll have to see. The last time Powell spoke, he kind of spoke through both sides of his mouth, saying that I really am hoping that we don't raise interest rates again. And then he buffered that by saying, but if the data suggests that it's necessary, I won't hesitate to pull the trigger. Of course, you have multiple Fed members, both dovish and hawkish, some recommending that they do one more rate hike, uh, others saying that enough is enough and we've gone high enough. I mean, when we think about it, the Federal Reserve in March uh, 2022 had their Fed funds rate between zero and a quarter percent. It's now five and a quarter to five and a half percent. So they've been exceedingly aggressive. The ECB has already said that they're done with rate hikes and are also uh, they are beginning to talk about rate cuts in April of next year. And so that component um, has really taken some strength into gold and allowed it to maintain above the price point. And that's why I think that breaking above 2000 now because of the geopolitical concerns, as well as the fact that the Federal Reserve if they do raise rates, it might only be one more at a quarter percent, and they could, in fact, be done with that cycle. Bodes well for gold, at least holding above 2000 and maybe challenging some of the higher levels of technical resistance. Okay, well, let's come back to gold uh, and talk about the Fed since you brought it up. Uh, why are you saying that there's 
even the possibility that they may raise rates once more. I'm just, I'm just curious to get your perspective. Certainly, I'm looking at the futures market, the CMF, CME Fed Watch tool. There's no significant probability of a rate hike anymore uh, after after the last one. Right. Well, it was about yesterday, I believe it was at around a 94% probability, according to the uh, CME's FedWatch tool. The reason I say that is when Fed speak the other week came out, they talked about wanting to maintain this level, but then they buffered it by saying, if the data suggests that inflation moves off of the current trajectory, that they wouldn't hesitate to pull the trigger. While I don't expect a rate hike in December, they've left open the possibility, and that's why I'm mentioning it here. Okay, so it is conditional it... on inflation then. Um, yeah, absolutely. You're, abs you're absolutely right. So let's talk about inflation. Um, if it's conditional on this one very important variable, then what do you think this very important variable is going to do in the next well, we've quarter? Really, we've really seen it decline. When you consider that uh, right after the March rate hike in 2022 in June, we had inflation at 9.1. The last reading was 3.7. They have definitely moved the needle. We're also getting economic reports that are suggesting a contraction in the United States economy. That's what the Federal Reserve is after by raising rates. We know that home sales are dramatically lower due to the excessively different rates in mortgages going from about uh, at the low end 3% when the Fed was at zero to about seven or 8% and treasury yields moving higher. So that is what I'm basing my commentary as well as analysis on in terms of the fundamental factors behind the most recent move. Are you, are you surprised at all at the uh, momentum that gold has seen despite higher yields throughout the second half of this year? talking about the 10 year yield in particular? Well, I, you know, we did see um, a dip in the market after it hit about 2020. At the end of October, it came down to about 1960. And I, I believe that that was the point in time when we did see those spikes in treasury yields. I believe that those have moved down incrementally, the yields lower at this point. They're still at elevated levels. But at the same time, they're not at the highs that they were previous to this point. I am not surprised that gold continues the momentum because as the Federal Reserve pivots to interest rate hikes to the pause, which is now the second FOMC meeting in which they have not raised rates and such a low probability that they will raise rates in December, that is the first sign that that traders are looking, excuse me, looking for to anticipate that that cycle is over, the rate hike cycle. If in fact they have now concluded the rate hikes, then it's simply a matter of when will we see rate cuts. According to the last projections, which would be September, the, the dot plot, we're looking at about the second quarter of next year. And now there are some analysts out there that are suggesting that they will start cutting it sooner. The key difference to me is the budget deficit and the overall deficit of the US budget, which is now at about 35 trillion. We have seen occasions when interest rates were at this level or much higher. However, we've never had this kind of debt to service. And from what I read, the trajectory that we are on right now in terms of just servicing the interest on the debt at that level is almost equal to the Defense Department's expenditure on an annual basis. That's never been the case. And so for that reason, I believe this is a different scenario than what we have seen in the past. And what does that mean for the markets when interest payments are this high? Well, when the debt is this high, the government has to service that debt. The interest on that debt is so high that, according to Chairman Powell and even Janet Yellen, they have both said that this level is kind of unsustainable for an extended period of time. It's just, it's paying to, when the interest rates go higher, the service on our national debt increases tremendously. 
There's a huge difference if your interest rates are sitting at around a half a percent or a percent or at four and five percent, which is the case right now. And so that's why that is unsustainable at this level, because the national debt is such at such a high level, a record level, I should say. Do you think this would be inflationary? Uh, here's one theory that I've heard. The debt would need to be monetized, which means that the government will have to create more money supply in order to cover this debt, hence the monetization. That would lead to an increase in inflation if we have more money supply. Um, so this decline in inflation is really transitory. <laughs> I'm not talking about inflation itself. I'm talking about the decline in inflation. Maybe they'll go back up. That's just a theory. What do you think? Well, I think there, there's some substance to that statement. Realize that this the whole thing of spending more money than you have in a budget is really in an experimental phase. It's really since World War II or not the 1930s in which that shift came. Prior to that, a government spent what it had in its coffers. And so this idea that to get ourselves out of a tough either recession or an economic scenario that you want to really ramp up, you simply you, you lower the interest rates. I do believe, though, that the statement about monetizing or printing more money to service the debt is accurate because it would be the only way to do it without cutting the deficit cutting the deficit which is to cut spending and the republicans and democrats can't agree on anything and each party is fighting amongst the, the right and the left wing on that side so they're really getting absolutely nothing done we just passed another stop gap to keep funding the government itself and that continues to be troublesome so i in terms of where it will lead to the one key that that i do believe has been evident in other times of high inflation is when that inflation levels come down prices don't necessarily follow quickly and some of them that uh, some of them actually remain elevated for quite some time i've never seen them raise prices on consumer goods and then lower them as inflation went down so Although the level is much lower, we see it in gasoline that has an oil products energy that has really um, moved lower. I think that it is a good climate for gold to move higher. What was stifling it before was all of the ratcheting of rates from zero to five and a half percent. This is another statement that I've heard and please, um, you know, either corroborate or disagree with this if you if you feel like. Uh, gold does very well during high periods of inflation, so very high inflation. Gold does very well during periods of deflation because that suggests either economic decline or a recession or both, uh, which is why we have the deflation that is usually coupled with volatility and, and so on and so forth, which is good for a safe haven like gold. Gold does not do well during periods of disinflation, which is low inflation. This can be evidenced all throughout uh, the 2010s when there was relatively low inflation and gold went nowhere. How would you respond to that? Well, you have to add one more variable to uh, that particular assumption, and that is gold does do very well during during periods of high inflation. But if there is active central bank monetary policy that's raising rates, that works against gold. That's counterintuitive because gold does not yield any interest. And because of that, as interest rates go higher, uh, yields are higher in banks, and so fixed income is higher, and you get dollars moving from gold into uh, fixed assets that have the safety, whether it be uh, U.S. government treasuries or interest rates in banks. And you have to add that variable, but that's a correct assumption, but you have to add in what are the interest rates doing at the same time? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go back to gold. Uh, huge run up again, once again, in uh, in November. Uh, could you attribute that mainly to the war in Israel, in the Middle East? Well, what I'm calling the October rally, and that was a move from about 1860 basis to February contract up to 2019, absolutely was due to the geopolitical unrest in the Middle East. 
We saw the same thing happen uh, in 2022 when uh, Russia Russian forces in, invaded Ukraine on the 20. Uh, make sure I get the February, February. 20, 22nd of February. Uh, yeah, 2022. Right. The price of gold moved up about a hundred dollars, hundred fifty dollars in subsequent days. Uh, same thing happened here over the course of the last two, uh, three to four weeks uh, since the outbreak of the war in the Middle East. Gold moved up about two hundred dollars. Is that the war premium that the price of gold sees? Yeah, a hundred to two hundred dollars every time there's a conflict. Well, what what I find most interesting is that when these events initially occur, you get a knee jerk reaction in which gold will move up substantially. We got that when Russia attacked Ukraine. We got that during the Israeli uh, conflict that's currently underway. And then after a while, it seems as though market sentiment says, well, we've added the premium and they begin to discount any news that's coming out um, from that geopolitical hotspot. So that's why we saw gold move as high as 2019 and then run back down, but yet the Middle East tensions were still fully in place. It seems as though market participants will want to shift their focus in the case of what we saw. The shift in focus was to the Federal Reserve and whether they'd raise rates or whether they'd continue the pause. Once it became evident that a pause or rate hike conclusion is most likely, then we saw them really focusing on that because the Ukraine war is still fully in play, but they have added a premium to that. Realize we've got gold above $2,000, just below it in the spot market. And that is those premiums continuing to remain in gold pricing, yes. Okay. Uh, finishing off on gold then, uh, the current levels that you're looking out for before the end of the year? I think that we could see profit taking occur at any point, especially on Thanksgiving. I get concerned because a couple of years back, we saw some traders in London take advantage of the long Thanksgiving uh, day holiday. And when the Americans were away and, and stuff with Turkey and the Canadians were away, so to speak, they really um, trashed the market, bringing it down substantially. But overall, I'm exceedingly bullish. I would look at any dip to be shallow in short term. I would look for 2000 to become support, major support at 1960. In terms of levels of resistance, it will have to challenge 2040. If it goes beyond, and that's a double top, goes beyond that 2080. And then the all time record high is touching $2,100 per ounce. So, I would think that it should go through at least one, if not challenge two of those levels, meaning 2080, before uh, traders step into pull profits. Uh, the jobs uh, numbers have been coming in uh, either hotter than expected, colder than expected. Right now, uh, as of today, the 22nd of November, as we're speaking, uh, initial jobless claims, weekly jobless claims came in uh, slightly lower than expected. So according to Reuters, the number of Americans filing new claims for unemployment benefits fell more than expected last week. But that likely does not change the view that the labor market is gradually slowing as higher interest rates cool demand in the economy. Do you agree with that last statement that there is this prevalent view that the labor market is slowing down overall? That's what the data suggests. And, and we've seen that for, if I didn't know about the report uh, that you're mentioning this week, but last week it came in with uh, unemployment and new claims uh, going way up above expectation. And if it's continuing, it's an obvious fact that we're getting an economic contraction. We could get some seasonal bursts in there with the holidays coming up, but overall, the Federal Reserve has put a, a dampener, really uh, has tempered any real expansion or burst of the economic GDP uh, as they've raised rates. So yes. Yeah, and the slowing down of the labor market, uh, how does that translate to how the Fed is going to react? Again, we go back to the Fed's dual mandate, unemployment and inflation. You brought up how important inflation is. It seems like the unemployment aspect is not talked about in media as much. What do you think is going to happen? Absolutely. Um, they have a dual mandate, but it seems as though there are times when they have a tendency to focus on one above the other. Right now, it is inflation because by raising rates, they will contract the economy. That's their goal. 
And so they are not looking at uh, contraction in labor as as important as getting inflation to their 2% target. And they've gone on record to say that in lieu of the Labor Department, we need to tackle inflation and the persistent aspect of it first. And they've done an exceedingly decent job getting it from 9% to just under 4%. Yeah. It seems that the stock markets believe the Fed's narrative of holding on raising rates uh, until at least the data suggests they should do more. Uh, does this signal more confidence in risk assets going forward? Well, we've we've seen confidence overall in U.S. equities consistently throughout the last couple of months. And then I always look at the stock market as not a stock market, but a market of stocks. And there are certain ones that are perf- excelling in performance, like NVIDIA, over, I think, 240% year over year. So the, the tech stocks, the AI stocks, are doing exceedingly well. And the commercial things like Walmarts and the retailers have been holding their own, even in this time of economic contraction. And so we've seen US equities hold up rather well. And there seems to be a lot more bulls than bears in terms of predictions of where US equities are going through December of this year. Finally, uh, before we close out, can you give us a primer on how you read charts? You have a unique way of reading candlestick charts. It's uh, it's uh, the Japanese method, I believe. Uh, you'll explain it better than I can. <laughs> well, the, typically uh, in the West, we look at either a line chart or a bar chart. And a bar chart plots four data points, the open, low, high, and close. And the high and low are projected by the top and bottom of the vertical line. On the left-hand side is represented by the open and on the uh, right-hand side is the close. All a Japanese candlestick does is it draws a rectangle around the open and closing price. And the reason they do that is they believe the most important data in a trading day, because they view it as a battle between the bulls and bears, is where a market opens and where it closes. Um, rather than a close-to-close relationship as we do in the West, if I say that gold lost $8, the intrinsic reference by all of our viewers is that we're comparing today's close to yesterday's close. The Japanese view the open and close of a single session to contain the most important information because of how it defines who was able to come out of that trading session Um, effectively? Was it the bullish faction or bearish faction? I also combine them with basic, straightforward Western technical indicators. That's the beauty of candlesticks is you don't give anything up. And so what I look for in in terms of the resistance levels that I have spoken about, it's been recent tops and support recent bottoms. And that's a standard Western technical way to look at it. I look at the 200, 100, and 50-day moving averages for short intermediate and long-term trend definition if it's above or below those particular uh, averages. So the way I view a market technically, first I look at the fundamentals, that big picture, and then I view that through the eyes of uh, candlestick and Western technical analysis. And it's worked well for me. And the, the majority of traders are are acutely aware of candlesticks and also use them in some form or another to some degree or another, I should say. So it's not um, just something that's used by the Asian or Eastern trader anymore. Interesting. Well, we can learn a lot more from you. Where can we learn from your uh, courses and your uh, your work and uh, your uh, analysis? Absolutely. Uh, the Gold Forecast YouTube channel has about 2,000 videos. We've got videos everywhere from about 2012 up to maybe two weeks ago. Our website, of course, thegoldforecast.com. That's a great place for information. And also decide if you want to sign up for a premium service. We do have Black Friday specials on there if you do go there. These are the least expensive uh, premium prices of the year. And then, of course, on Twitter, it's Gary S. Wagner, at Gary S. Wagner is my Twitter handle. So those three places are the best ways to find information on what we do and how we look at the markets. 
All right. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gary. Appreciate your time. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you, all those in Canada and the United States. And, and globally, let's all be thankful uh, that, that, that we're still here, the pandemic is over, and, and that it, this year will end soon and next year will be better. Yeah. Good messages. Thank you for uh, coming on the show. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to follow Gary in the links down below and subscribe.